<laughs> Hi, Val. Good to be with you today. Native son, bellwether state always. Mm. You took Michigan before. It, you've got to take it this time. Oh, I sure want to have the support of the people of Michigan. I think Michiganders recognize that as a guy who was born here and raised here, uh, I want to see Michigan thriving again. I want to see the auto industry not just leading and profitable. I want to see it getting stronger and stronger, expanding across this country and across the world. Uh, I believe Michigan is coming back. I see Governor Snyder. I'm very, very impressed with what he's doing. I want to take the kind of policies he's pursuing here and bring into Washington. Great timing having the governor actually here in person. We had heard he was endorsing you, of course, calling you the best person for the job with your background. But did you get on the phone and say, uh, hey, Rick, I need you to help me get that other Rick off my back? Did you ask <laughs> him to come here in person? Actually, uh, uh, he was kind enough to give me a call. <laughs> Uh, and uh, and we spoke uh, some time ago. We've had the conversation about uh, uh, this uh, this possible endorsement. I'm absolutely delighted, and I think his support will make a real difference because he and I have very similar backgrounds. Uh, we spent our careers in the private sector. We know what it takes to actually get business growing and hiring people again. That's what Michigan needs. That's what America needs. And you seem to be pulling up some momentum, and this certainly is a nice boost with the governor. Mr. Santorum, though, he is like kind of breathing down your neck, and the polling is showing has him ahead in, in several polls. Mm. Well, uh, Senator Santorum is not terribly well known yet uh, by the people of the country. He hasn't been under the uh, the microscope like the rest of us have. And, and as people get a ch chance to spend some time with him, they'll recognize that he voted to raise the debt ceiling five different times, that the government grew some 80 percent while he was in Washington, uh, that he voted for billions of dollars of earmarks, including earmarks to his own state, including a polar bear exhibit at the at the Pittsburgh Zoo. Th these kinds of excesses and spending by government are one of the reasons my party got in so much trouble. So I think as people look at our respective records, me a guy who cut spending, balanced the budget, uh, and he a guy who grew spending, I think, uh, I think I'll get support of Michiganders. It is crucial for you, Governor, especially being from this state. Uh, what happens if you don't take Michigan, though? Does that make you fold up your tent? Oh, I'm, I'm planning on uh, getting the support of the people of Michigan. And uh, regardless of what happens in any one contest, I have to keep on battling to get all the delegates I can to get up to the 1,150 or so that it takes to become our nominee. I, I really think that I'm uh, really the only guy in the race that has a good prospect of defeating President Obama, in part because I'm not a lifelong politician. I haven't spent my life in Washington like, like the president has. I spent my life in the private sector. I think that kind of understanding of the economy is what's needed to defeat President Obama. Governor, I saw your commercial last night. Uh, you were riding in a car. Uh, what kind of car was that, by the way? Do you know? Was it yeah. down here in Michigan? Yes, it was. Uh, it was in Livonia, uh, a Chrysler 300. And uh, uh, now that was a rental car. Uh, my, my car is a Mustang, but my car is back at home. All right, sir. You were driving through a working class neighborhood. Mm -hmm. You certainly, you and your dad, come from humble beginnings. You've lived and created the American dream for yourself, but as you know, Michigan is suffering so, mm. so badly, mm. still way at the bottom, as the governor indicated. But uh, some, some of those people living in those areas, more of them probably would have lost their jobs and their homes had not we had the bailout. And at that time, uh, you know, and subsequently we've been hearing that, you know, you didn't want that bailout. Was that a mistake on your part? or? Uh, I know you said there's been some misunderstanding about your position on, on the, on the uh, automobile bailout. Well, the auto executives went to Washington and said, we want $50 billion, a bailout. I said, no, the industry ought to go through a managed bankruptcy. And then, if financial help is needed by the government, then it can be applied at that point. Ultimately, that's what happened. It took them a long time to recognize it. It took about six months, but they finally went through the managed bankruptcy. And by virtue of having done so, the industry has come back. So I'm, uh, I'm delighted that that was the course that was finally taken and glad to see the industry come back. Speaking of the auto industry, as we're being wrapped up here, um, you called out the UAW and Bob King by name. Now, surely a lot of uh, labor goes with the Democrats anyway, but is that kind of risky uh, in, De in the Detroit area? You know, organized labor can play an important role in our economy and has. But sometimes union bosses get the message wrong. I care very deeply about the U.S. auto industry. I want to see it thrive. And my policies will be the best policies to encourage the growth of industry, including the auto industry. And uh, if union bosses decide to try and get in the way of the industry or to, uh, to do things that aren't in the best interest of their workers, I'm going to call them out for it.
today certainly you're preaching to the choir, but how do you make other people, humble people, how do you let them know that you they you need to be their president? Uh, right now, are, are you too wealthy to be relatable to the common person? You know, one of the great experiences of being in my faith was that we don't have a full-time ministry, and so we're asked as individuals to take the leadership of a congregation. And I served as pastor in my congregation for about 10 years. And in that responsibility, I helped people who needed welfare support, helped people with, uh, with housing support, uh, worked with folks that were going through divorces and depression, drug problems. Uh, and so I know very deeply the kinds of problems that Americans are facing, particularly when they're seeing long-term unemployment. I understand that the great needs of the American people uh, as a person can who's been close to a, a congregation of individuals. And I want to make sure that I help the people of America that need help most, and that's middle-income Americans. The wealthy are doing just fine. I want to help the Americans who are really struggling right now, and I think my expertise in the economy and jobs is just what America is looking for. The very poor, though, some people were insulted and sad when you said you weren't worried about the very poor. Well, my, my point about the very poor is that we have a safety net to care for the very poor, and when the safety net needs mending and improving, we should focus on that and improve it. And there are the changes I'd make to help the safety net, but the folks that have really been hurt in this economy are those in the middle class, the great 95 percent plus, who, uh, who have found that uh, their median incomes have gone down by 10 percent in this country. Unemployment has gone on for a far too long period of time. It's middle-income folks who really need, need a lot of help right now.